Monday, our ZBA meeting for Monday, May 24th, 2021 to order. Roll call, please. Maurice LaRosa. Here. Andrew Abanowitz. Mary Ann Turner here. Charlie Masterberti. Here. Kelly Davis. Here. Robert Kwasnicki. Kathy Plopper. Rich Stroney. Here. Chairman, you will need to use your alternate. Rich, Rich Stroney, Stroney will be seated tonight. Everybody plays. Everybody plays. Uh, evacuation. Two means of egress out of the town hall chamber. It's been a while since we've been here. First is directly behind you in front of the, the council chambers here. Um, turn around, go out the stair, out the door, double doors. Take a right down into the parking lot. The next is to your right, my left, down the double doors. First door on the left, down the stairs, out into the parking lot. Can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Pledge allegiance, Pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Should the TV be on? I think it comes on as is the TV supposed to be on, or does it just come on as we're needed? Um, so we're not doing hybrid, so um, if we needed it, then we can turn it on, but there isn't another part of this meeting like the town council and the board of ed have been doing where people can call in. Um, Usually the TV's on that we can see. You don't do that anymore? Yeah, so if we see their presentation on the screen here. Um, I guess not. I mean, everything's changed in the chambers now. So. You check into it for next time. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that answers the question. Nice work, Jen. Good job. That was quick. Yeah, I got it. Right. He's listening in the other room. Um, no town attorney's report, no old business, uh, legal notice. The Enfield Zoning Board of Appeals will hold a public hearing on Monday, May 24, 21 at 7 p.m. in the Council Chambers, Town Hall 820 <coughs> Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, concerning the following. ZBA 2021-0330, 128 Moody Road, applicant of the zoning appeal of the zoning enforcement officer cease and desist order following a notice of violation of section 6.2 industrial zones use table 128 moody road llc owner applicant map 93 lot 5 i1 zone tabled from april 26 2021 do you want me to read the second uh, no we'll take them one at a time okay will the applicant come forward State your names and address for the record, please. Sure, good evening. My name is Derek Donnelly. Uh, my address is 2 Concord Way, Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, my name is Carl Landolina, 487 Spring Street, Windsor Locks, Connecticut. First, I'd like to start by thanking the uh, board for giving us the one month uh, continuance. We appreciate that. And I guess it is uh, my first meeting back anywhere in, in, in a year, so it's good to be, uh, I guess, in person. Um, just plainly stated, uh, we did, we represent uh, Moody Road LLC, 128 Moody Road LLC, who did receive a cease and desist for, uh, from your zoning enforcement officer related to the parking of uh, trucks at the property there where the Jarmark family runs their farm. And, and simply stated, we believe that uh, we are not running a truck terminal. These trucks are used in the farming operation. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Donnelly, who's prepared a presentation for you. Thank you very much. Um, if I could approach, I have uh, handouts from the presentation to just uh, give to everyone, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, and uh, like uh, like my colleague, Attorney Landolina, I just want to say how happy I am to be able to be here in person and do this. Uh, we've uh, waited a long time. This is my first one, that's for sure. 
Uh, okay, so if we'll go right into it. Um, just a little background for you about the property um, and, uh, and the LLC. 128 Moody Road uh, is a division of Jarmok Farms. I have Owen Jarmok and Steve Jarmok here with me in the audience. Um, as you probably know, Jarmok Farms has been operating for over 100 years. Um, primarily, their business has been broadleaf tobacco. Over the last 10 years, that's expanded into vegetable production, including the production of squash and pumpkins. Um, historically, Jarmok Farms had transported their own products to, uh, to market, or they had uh, contracted with trucking companies to uh, transport their products to market. However, the diversification of the farm led to higher demand um, and also moving the product farther away. Okay, and, and that's very important, and we'll come back to that in a second. Um, federal law allows farms to transport their products uh, to farm uh, or to markets within 150 air miles of the farm, okay? So you could have your own trucks from your farm not registered with the Department of Transportation and you could load them up with produce and bring them to a grocery store or a, or a supplier within 150 air miles of the, uh, of the farm. However, as the business has expanded, the farm uh, has found markets well beyond that 150 miles. So we now are talking about markets in Illinois, Ohio, Virginia, and Texas. Um, as a result of that, the Jarmox understood that they needed to register trucks with the Department of Transportation if they were gonna ship their goods all across the country, which they do. Um, as a result, they started Connecticut Valley Transportation, um, and that was started in uh, 2000, late 2017. Um, obviously, they started their own LLC for insurance purposes, which I'm sure you can appreciate. Um, the, the LLC owns the trucks and wants to make sure that those trucks bring products to market, don't interfere with the rest of farming operations if there was an accident or, or something along those lines. So it is a separate LLC. Um, Importantly, it also is now federally licensed with the DOT, so it can transport beyond those 150 miles, okay? Um, obviously, not all crops go to market all the time, and when they're not hauling crops to market, they're hauling products and supplies back to the farm, okay? Uh, things like seed and fertilizer and pallets, um, and DOT categorizes these things as general freight. So um, in the CEO's report, you'll, you'll probably hear about later, he talks about that the trucks are registered for agricultural products and general freight. This is the type of general freight we're talking about. Products coming back to the farm, okay? Things you, things you need, building supplies, things of that nature, okay? They currently have 12 trucks in operation that are doing this. So we'll get the next page, um, just again to point out the property itself, if you're not familiar with it, um, you see the map from the town GIS, um, and we've got Fermi High School located in the middle of the map, and we're talking about the property immediately behind Fermi High School, uh, that's to the east of it there. Okay. Um, and indeed, as, as you heard from the uh, reading of the notice, it is in the I-1 zone, industrial zone. If you go on to the next page, um, the ZEO's order, the cease and desist order, specifically cites to section um, 6.2, the chart 6.2 in your zoning regulations, which very clearly says that truck terminals slash truck sales are not permitted in the it, as, uh, as a use in this zone, okay? Um, we think that is uh, a mistake and that there was a portion of the regulations that were overlooked. And primarily, that is why we're here to ask you to reverse the decision of the zoning enforcement officer. Um, specifically, Article 3 of the regulations are the general requirements of, of your regulations. They apply to all zones, okay? So if you look at the next page, we'll just break that down a little bit, what we're talking about here. So again, general requirements in Article 3, okay? They, pro, specifically with respect to commercial vehicles, section 3.30.13 prohibits commercial vehicles in various zones, okay? Some of those prohibitions are specific to regu, uh, residential areas. Others are across all zones, okay? Importantly, 3.30.13G states 
nothing herein shall be construed to prohibit commercial vehicles that are used as part of the following, and goes on to say, a permitted agricultural, farming, forestry, or nursery gardening use, okay? And based on that language in Article 3, we think the zoning enforcement officer's reliance on section, on chart 6.2 is misplaced, okay? Importantly, and we'll get back to this in a minute, those uh, commercial vehicle regulations were added in um, 112503 to your code. So you go on to the next page, let's talk a little bit about the language in the regulation. So again, the regulation says, nothing herein shall be construed to prohibit commercial vehicles that are used as part of a permitted agricultural, farming, forestry, or nursery gardening use. Okay, now here we have an industrial zone, okay? Agricultural use is permitted in this industrial zone by special permit after December of 2012. But on this specific property, we have farming going back for decades, okay? And, and we'll, we'll get to some proof of that in a few moments. Um, but we know that when the regulations were passed into the table um, in December of 2012, and they specifically um, made agriculture a, a special permit use, um, this was already being used as an agricultural, uh, as a farm. And thus, it is, uh, it is grandfathered in there. But the other part of the language is really important as well. Um, and, and the regulation says that commercial vehicles, specifically references commercial vehicles that are used as part of the agricultural use. And the as part of is very important. It doesn't say used exclusively to take products to market. It doesn't say only to take products to market. It says used as part of, okay? And I think that's what we have exactly here. We have commercial trucks that are used as part of the farming business, as part of the agricultural use to get products to market and to bring supplies back to the farm, okay? Um, and as a result, you know, again, we're talking about a, mo a very modern farming operation. It's diversified significantly over the last 10 years. Uh, finding new ways to stay uh, relevant, active, and profitable um, in this day. And, and the trucks are vital to that, okay? They're a vital part of the agricultural use. Um, and we believe the use uh, that we're describing here fits very squarely within the exemption in, in 33013G. Um, and as a result, we believe the zoning enforcement officer's reliance on the table at 6.2 was misplaced. <clears throat> but if you don't agree with us on that one, we've got a little more for you, okay? Um, because this, having commercial vehicles on the property actually also predates the zoning regulations. Um, Trucks have been used on this property continuously as accessory to the agricultural use for years. Um, the prior property owner immediately to my clients was uh, Farm Credit East. We've got an affidavit that we've included in there uh, showing that they rented out the property to, uh, to a company to store their trucks on the property, okay? Um, immediately before that, uh, that company also, um, LaCourie Sand and Gravel, also rented that property from the owner before that. And we've got an affidavit from one of their drivers saying that indeed they were picking up the trucks at the property um, every day from 2014 to 2018. And then prior to that, the Tchaikovsky family also, or entities they controlled, because they had various iterations of who the owner was, but it was all within the family. They, they owned the property uh, dating back actually to the 1800s. And we have an affidavit included there from uh, Mr. Tchaikovsky, who says they always had trucks at the property as long as he can remember as well. So we've had trucks on the property going back for decades um, that are accessory to the agriculture use. Um, I think all of us have, have driven by a farm, stopped at a farm stand. Of course, you're going to see trucks in various formats bringing pro crops to market. It's just part of the operation and always has been. Um, just now we're talking about larger trucks and bringing the, market, bringing the products to market a little farther away. 
So we've included those affidavits for you as part of your packet, and you can certainly review those as well. So again, we think the language fits very squarely within the language of the regulation, uh, permits this use very, very cleanly. Um, and if, if you don't believe us on that, we do think that the trucks have been used at the property long enough to create a grandfathered in use. But if you don't agree with that, we've got one other thing for you as well. Um, and that's actually a, a constitutional argument here. Um, because really what we're talking about is a, is a regulation that potentially would violate the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, the US Constitution. And what we're talking about there is limiting the ability of a business to participate in interstate commerce, okay? Because essentially what the regulation, if the regulation really does limit my clients to only having trucks that can travel within 150 miles, okay, not registered with DOT, then that prevents them from accessing markets beyond 150 miles and violates their rights under the Commerce Clause. So we've included some information uh, for you on that as well. I'm not gonna belabor the citations and give a, a law school lecture, but I, I think it's an important uh, item to bring up. Um, again, I don't think we need to get that far because I think the regulations are very, very clear that this use is permitted in the agricultural and farming zone. So um, that's, that's the bulk of our presentation. Um, certainly if you have any questions for myself, uh, Attorney Landolina, or the applicants, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, but again, very, very clearly, Section 33013G, again, the, the general provisions of your regulations uh, specifically exclude commercial vehicles when we're speaking about the agricultural farming use. Mr. Chairman, yep. I'd like a five minute recess so we can read the materials that he put in front of us. Well, do we need a recess or did you just take five minutes? And Whichever way it works for you, but I'd like a few minutes to read the documents. Of course. Be good? Absolutely. I think even us two lawyers can keep quiet for five minutes. I don't be hard, but we'll try. Thank you. You can get me a coffee. <laughs>
All set, uh, Charlie? Yes. Any questions of the applicant? Um, does your client pay property tax on the trucks? Yes. Well, the, the LLC does, yes. To, to the town like you would any other thing? Absolutely. And I did notice um, in some of the documents we received that we're not just, it's kind of broad what we can have on a farm. Mm -hmm. there, there's move of trees, the pallets for the, when they were doing some work in the woods doing something, food, which I believe are the pumpkins or maybe other, but I, but I got the impression they were also moving other people's products. Well, they're moving things back to the farm. Um, not that like way, said. not stuff coming to the farm, but stuff that was, and I may, and I, I'm sorry, but I left my pack and material on my desk, um, so I don't have it in front of me. Do you know what I'm asking? Yes. I think what you're asking, is, what she's asking is, are you moving, I, we know the trucks are moving his product. Are the trucks for hire? Are they moving other people's products? The, the trucks are accessory to the farm. Yeah. Do you want to come up? Go ahead. Right. If the trucks are for hire. Right. But I know they might be moving farm materials, things you grew or others grew. Owen Jarmark is joining at the table. 33 uh, School Street, Enfield, Connecticut. Um, to the extent of your questions, I mean, like we said, the trucks aren't accessory used to the farm. They play a vital role in moving our products. Um, there's something that people in Texas love, spaghetti squash from Connecticut. Um, something about the soil i don't know um but the trucks are accessory used to the farm what she want, what she's asking is outside of your stuff from your farm are they moving are you for hire by right. somebody I, else i go pick up another man's pallets and bring them back to our farm to use or someone's else cardboard or i'm not the trucks are accessory used to our farm and operation well, that's not the question right the question they rented out they have been in the past but only for a farm. Right. I call you and say, hey, you've got trucks. Can I hire you to bring my product somewhere? No. No, Jasmine. Yes. Yeah. Uh, currently speaking, we are, I mean, we are too busy. I mean, in the past, maybe if it was the middle of the winter and we had a slow day, but currently speaking, we're too busy farming. Um, our principal occupation is farmers. Got anything, I think one of my questions is the kind of the generality of defining farming operation, right? Is it just the farming? And this might be something that we need to address with the town as well, Mr. Chairman. But is farming operation the active farming operations on the farm itself and then moving that product to market? Or is it just the equipment related to farming itself? It, right, so it's a little vague of a term, and that's where I think I'm stuck. Absolutely, and your zoning regulations are particularly vague when it comes to farming. Um, and Attorney Landalita can comment on this as well. But there's no there's no definition of farming. In fact, the words farming is only used a few times within the regulations. The agricultural use is used a little more, but again, not defined. Um, and then the unique part about your regulations is that it, it really does limit farming and agricultural use specifically within a variety of zones, whereas most other regulations I'm aware of are, are far more generous with where it's provided um, and, and a little more carefully defined. So we don't have a definition within your regulations, leaving it largely up to interpretation. It's, it's uh, vague to begin with. If I could address that as well. Uh, for the record, Carl Landolina, so um, the, you well know interpreting regulations, the first thing you do is look at your own regulations and see, look for a definition. And if there isn't one, you use the common definition and usually look to a dictionary. As, as it relates to farming and agricultural uses, the courts have said the next stop after your regulations is 1-1Q of the general statutes which is a laundry list of what the state considers to be agriculture. And the list goes on forever. It takes up, I don't know if you've ever seen the blue statute books, it takes up 
in small print over a page and a half. And it encompasses all uh, cultivation of crops, animal husbandry, uh, things like uh, farming fish or oysters, and they're all in there. And then it goes on to say, and the processing of these uh, products. And, uh, you know, uh, the improvement of, of, of uh, activities in buildings and so on and so forth. It's a very broad and, and wide. So almost anything that happens on a farm generally speaking, can fit within the definition. There's very few activities that I'm aware of um, that don't fit within the definition of agriculture under 1-1Q. It's extremely broad. I, I wish I had a copy here for you to take a look at, but, but I don't. It's a good question. But well, and, uh, and I think that, again, farming, again, all, all the processes are associated with growing and cultivating the crops, I understand mm -hmm. that, but when you, when you put in that word operation, right, shipping to market, um, do the trucks really fall under that and the operation of the truck itself to, from, whatever happens in between, right? And, and how do we define that within the state statutes under the DOT rules mm -hmm. of having to have them defined under Department of Transportation as a freight carrier type company, right? So and I, I think that's where I might need some help on this as well appreciate what you said, Attorney Landolina. Mm -hmm. um, it's that bigger picture that it, right. it has a question mark for me right now. I, I mean, without actually looking at 1-1Q, and, and, and I, I, I can say with almost certainty that, yes, the transportation of goods off the site to market is included in the definition of farming. But, but uh, you know, if you want someone else to take a look at it, obviously you're free to do that. You know, we want to make sure you have all the information you need. Uh, when I look at, um, you know, a truck terminal, and that's the language that's used in your regulation, uh, which is actually, I, I um, the other day I went to the town hall and upstairs for the first time in over a year, and I looked at every set of regulations you have going back to the 30s um, for that specific term, and it actually goes back quite a ways. Um, you've regulated truck terminals for, for a long time. But if you look at the common sort of understanding of what a truck, it's never been defined that I can see in your regulations, but it's been there for many years. And if you look at the sort of the common definition, normally a truck terminal is where tr trucks are parked uh, uh, and, and then they're dispatched to locations to, you know, pick up from point A, which is not where, the, you know, nothing's leaving the terminal. The trucks are just sitting there. They're going from the terminal to point A, bringing goods to point B and coming back to rest at night at the terminal. That's typically what, it, what a terminal would be. And, and the term that's used most often, I was in shipping for a while, the thing that I think Marianne was talking about, LTL, which is less than truckload, where you don't have to rent the whole truck, you get a little space and they're bringing 20 people's goods. That's not, what, that's not you know, what's happening here, as you've heard from the, from the applicant. Um, he's busy enough where these trucks are being used uh, you know, fully in his operations. And, and the other thing, we all know ac farms are commercial activities. There's, you know, they have to be. That's what they are. So they're just like any other commercial activity. They, and, and uh, instead of manufacturing something, they're growing something, and they have to get those products out in a timely fashion. And so. And if I could add uh, just one thing to that, Derek Donnelly, um, again, the language of your regulations is really important and it's really important to look at every word and how that is written okay um, and again it says as part of the following not exclusively for not just for it says as part of so when this was drafted the carve out for commercial vehicles was very specific um, and very specific to permitted agricultural farming forestry and nursery gardening use now we're not talking about forestry, right? But if you're gonna have commercial vehicles that are used in forestry, well, what are they doing, right? That you're loading a truck up with large logs so you can bring them to a timber mill and have them cut into wood. Um, you know, or you're, or you're grinding that up and bringing it to a mulch yard. You are moving the product away. Um, and I think, it's, I think the forestry 
one is really interesting uh, within the regulation, even though that's not what we're talking about here, because really what we're talking about is the need for commercial vehicles to uh, provide for these uh, types of specifically excluded uses. Kelly. So I just, I do have one question. I'm looking at what was in our original packet, and it just has cargo hauled by Connecticut Valley Transportation, um, and it lists um, motor vehicles, U.S. mail, construction, metal sheet. I'm just trying to understand how that is um, related to the farming. Well, I, I don't know about the U.S. mail one, I, and I'm not really sure exactly what you're referring to, but, you know, for instance, uh, the vehicles we, we uh, just recently, um, you know, the, the uh, farm was moving an excavator from its main location to another one of its farms. You know, we have multiple locations that we're working in uh, across both um, Enfield, Summers, and also East Windsor as well. Um, you can't really drive an excavator down the down the road, although I'm sure it's been done before. It's usually frowned upon. So that that's the type of vehicles what, that are being moved. May I ask what you're referring to? Okay. Um, it's the company overview. Oh, I, from DOT's website or something? It was in our packet. Yeah. Yeah, that's from the U.S. DOT. Okay. You'll notice that a couple of them uh, are marked. Uh, Do you have an General extra copy freight. of that? Because I left my pack at home. Thank you. And this is Owen Jarmok again. In terms of that being marked, we hire a third party that does all of our filings and stuff with the DOT um, so we can focus on our farm operations. So I'm sure the U.S. mail would just be an oversight. And we've never hauled mail ever. Um, but in terms of construction material or something like that or building material, I mean, we just built five barns. I mean, we go pick up wood and lumber and bring it back to the farm. So that that is classified by a DOT as construction material. So that's why it's listed. Is it possible that this document I have in my hand just lists all the possible things that they could haul? It does. You'll notice on there there's checks or X's next to the ones that they're listed with them as carrying. Yeah, they're not picked up. It's blank. You don't see that on these. You got it, I think, Charlie? It's on a secondary page. My question would be, if they were for private hire, that would be against our right. rates. So he admitted in the past that they were for private hire. I guess we. So would just I guess to answer the. So I was going to say we should Can't probably just you. make a note if we were to put this through. That it wouldn't cover private hire. So. So to answer the question for private hire, in order to register these vehicles to go past the 150 mile air radius for the DOT, you have to put a portion plates on them. They're not commercial plates, they're called the portion plates. In order to put commercial or portion plates on them, you must have an MC number for the IRP office in Hartford. They will not let you register them unless you pay the $300 fee that then marks you for hire. Um, it's a technicality of the US DOT. The DOT doesn't recognize farms, they recognize safety and freight. They don't, they don't govern us separately as your regulations do. Correct. Right. And these documents we're looking at, Kelly, I'm reading them to mean um, could do, not does do. Correct. The ex yeah, and, and I appreciate you sharing them with me. If I could, uh, to your point, Commissioner, um, I don't think the regulations are specific that say, say that it has to be limited. I really don't. It says as part of it. So I do think it's a little broader. Again, as Attorney Lena mentioned, truck terminal is not defined. So it makes it very difficult to understand what exactly that concept is. Um, I think of truck terminal like Fleming's in Suffield, where you know there's a line of, of 
the storage containers and they sell out a, a certain percentage of them and they, you know, they go off and pick up and, and drop back off. So that's certainly not what we're talking about. But, you know, also the um, conversation about, you know, how, how one would regulate or prove that they were not shipping or shipping from even an enforcement office uh, side is nearly impossible. I mean, you'd almost have to have the town looking at the manifests and things like that. It's, a, it's, it's in my mind, beyond the scope of the regulations. Thank you. All right, any other, other questions? Are you gonna, is Rick gonna, yep. then I'll have questions. I need to hear him first. Well, I understand that. I'm Not just saying questions for these guys. <laughs> Maybe. I have, to, I have to get to other people. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there anybody wishing to speak in favor or against the Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. He is one. No, I don't want to close the hearing. We're not closing the hearing. Can I please do this? No, hang on a minute. He's somebody that's going to speak in favor or against the application. He's staff. Right, and staff will come after we hear everybody. Okay, that's odd. Is there anybody in the audience wishing to speak in favor or against the application? Okay. Can we hear from the zoning enforcement officer, please? All right. Um, I don't think anybody here doesn't think that uh, the business is not in the uh, business of transporting farm materials from time to time or during the normal course. Uh, a lot of the photos that you received in the packets uh, showed, showed the address of 128 Moody Road during the winter time. You'll notice that there may be one uh, truck there. There may be none there. Um, and numerous photos that I have, they were taken during the day. The trucks are gone from the site. That's in the middle of winter time. So obviously the trucks are someplace else doing something else. Now, they have their own uh, Facebook account and page, and if you look at that, it'll show the, uh, the trucks, different locations, um, some of which delivering construction pads to numerous locations, uh, delivering Keras reels to numerous locations. I don't think it, either of those are farm uh, uses. Also delivering uh, groceries to the five boroughs of New York and to a couple of Trader Joe's up in Bedford, New Hampshire. Again, I don't think that's part of the farm uh, accessory use. They're in the business of transporting goods other than farm materials. Um, I'm not saying that they don't use it in the use of the farm, but it's used as a uh, trucking terminal. The Karis reels are not kept on site. The groceries, I don't believe, are kept on site at 128 Moody Road, which means they have to go pick them up someplace and then deliver them up to New Hampshire or to New York. Um, the same with a number of other things. These uh, construction pads, they're delivered all over. Construction isn't part of uh, the normal use, I don't believe, of the farm business at that location. It's several other locations. Uh, the delivery of machinery up to Vermont. This is all open to the public and on their Facebook page. So, like I said, I don't think that uh, the use of the trucks are not used for the farm use to a certain extent, but they're also used as commercial vehicles to transport goods other than what is produced on the farm. And that is the definition of the tractor trailer terminal commercial business terminal. And that's what the violation is based on, along with other things. Any questions? You want to elaborate on what you mean by what other things? Uh, for instance, uh, at the uh, prior meeting uh, that we had regarding 69 Broadbrook Road, Mr. Jarmock made a comment about the storing of uh, materials, pumpkins, that were growing outside of Enfield, and his intent was to store them in the new barn uh, on Broadbrook Road and then transport them to uh, 
he said he was the largest distributor on this side of the Mississippi. That's materials that are transported interstate and items that are not grown in the town of Enfield or produced in any, uh, any of his farms here in Enfield. Then we're assuming that he has no farming in other parts of the state, which I'm going to guess he does. He probably does, but storing them in Enfield in a barn here and then transporting, that's, that's a transportation company and warehousing. Any other questions from any board members? Thank you. Does the applicant have anything to add? Yeah. Yeah. You can't, they can't see you on TV and they won't be able to hear you unless you're, Carly has to take your seat because they can't see you. Oh, okay. oh, sorry. Um, my name is Owen Jarmark again, uh, for the record. So what we can just go through the things that Mr. Rochelle said that he saw on our Facebook page. Um, Trader Joe is very simple, delivering pumpkins and squash. Um, it's not a well-known fact, but so we grow butternut squash as part of our new line of business. The busiest time for butternut squash is actually right before Easter. Um, that squash comes in, it's stored in our buildings. Some of it is grown outside of Enfield, to the extent of his statement. We have farms in Summers, um, East Windsor. That comes in, it's stored, and then it goes out. It comes in in large on large agriculture trailers. It's packaged into smaller bushel boxes with 12 butternut squash with a PLU sticker on each individual one, and then it goes out. Butternut squash doesn't need to be stored and refrigerated. It's, it's best stored about 45 degrees in an insulated steel building. Um, so if anyone's wondering why, maybe there's a bunch of these farm insulated steel buildings popping up. There you have it. Um, in terms of Keras reels, a byproduct of the manufacturing of reels is wood shavings for animal bedding. Um, we do have animals. We go there to pick up wood shavings. Um, what other? Envi um, construction pads, those are environmental timber mats. If you drive past our farm on Charnley Road right now, um, you would see a big stack of environmental timber mats. Um, those are, to, you know, to protect the environment and wetland soils if you're going to do any work. Um, did I miss any? Um, machinery, picking up a machine in Vermont. Um, I believe that was a low, Mr. Rochelle. Um, I think we purchased that one. It's orange. Um, it's not very new or nice, but my dad doesn't like new equipment. Um, I, on the other hand, uh, bleed green. Um, I think we covered them all. Um, and all those activities broadly would fit into this definition of agriculture. Um, it's, yeah. Any other questions for me? Well, before we do the musical chairs. Any questions? Yeah, I, I just want to clarify the the material you transport is either coming from or going to your farm. Correct. No one else's stuff for hire. No. The material we transport is coming to or going to our farm. Correct. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Rochelle. If I may, uh, on his Facebook page, uh, there's a delivery to uh, Bedford, New Hampshire, August 10th of groceries. That's what's listed on his Facebook page. Also, uh, January 16th, uh, January 15th, Karis uh, Reels, delivering reels to Meriden. Um, I don't think that's sawdust that they're using for bedding if they're delivering it to Meriden. That's what they have on their Facebook page. Um, as for the construction pads, the pictures don't look at like any place here in Enfield. They certainly don't look like Charnley Road, so they're, just, they're delivering them to other construction locations. So uh, just as a, a little discrepancy as to what Mr. Jarmuck said. If I could, without a doubt, when my clients have leftover products they're not using, they absolutely sell them. It is 
mentioned, as Attorney Elena Lena mentioned, a commercial enterprise. And so, um, you know, again, those are materials they have on the farm. They will get rid of them, absolutely. They're not renting the trucks out as a truck terminal, as you heard tonight. So, also, with respect, uh, litigating the posts on a Facebook page is not necessarily the um, most viable news here when we're, when we're talking about when we're talking about violations. So, um, you know, the, the idea that somehow we're, there's a gotcha moment on a Facebook post or something like that seems uh, seems a little bit of a stretch when we're talking about very clear language and the regulation that permits this use. Any other questions? Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Um, Mr. Chair, sorry. Um, I just wanted to know if you wanted to open it up to the public again, or because um, I know we didn't catch that and we usually do that. Um, I can do that again. All right. Um, Everybody, could, uh, Mr. Chair, there was an email that came in um, for this application. Um, I should have printed it out, but I just caught it now. Um, would you like me to read it into the record? Sure. Um, it is from Edward Sergil and Kelly Grandall of 6 Park Street, Unit 2 in Enfield, Connecticut. And the email reads um, that I would like to vote against having all those big, very loud trucks going by the house on Park Street. Kids play here. It's very loud with all those trucks going by. Um, Edward Sergil and Kelly Grandall do not want those trucks on Park and Moody Street. We both live at 6 Park Street, Unit 2, Enfield, Connecticut. Thank you. Okay. So. Last time, anybody wish to speak in favor against? And once again, you guys get the last set. So. I think we're all set, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your time. So moved. Okay, by Marianne, do I have a second? Second. By Rich. Discussion. I believe it's farm use. And I believe I went by the property. There's lots of trucks over there. I appreciate people not wanting trucks going by, but I'm pretty sure that there's more than just Mr. Jarmock's trucks driving down park because it's a pretty busy area. Um I think that that's true, that 3.30G is clear. It's a permitted agricultural and farming, forestry, and nursery gardening use. And I believe that the only way that a farm can work is to have trucks of that size and caliber to move their products. And I don't mean to be facetious or funny in any way, but if we're going to Mars at some point, Mr. Jarmok, it may not be him and it may not be his son, but it might be his grand, great, great grandson who decides to move the product by rocket. And we will have to change our rules. So right now, I believe that his request and the cease and desist is not a valid one in my opinion. Anybody else? With my two cents. Um, I believe the cease and desist is valid. I believe the state of Connecticut gives farmers 150 miles until they force them to register their vehicles and become commercial vehicles. It doesn't limit a farm to uh, moving their product to commerce, um, but it does limit them to do it a certain way. And if you want to go, you know, further than that, then you have to become a trucking company. And then you can move your product wherever you want, however you want, however far as you want. And therefore, I believe that, uh, you know, once they've decided to uh, turn around and bring in multiple trucks to be able to go across the country, they've now changed it from agricultural use for the farm to a trucking company. The fact that they are bringing in product from outside of town, even though it's their own farm, they're still bringing it from outside the town, not off of the farm. Um, if you want to move product from a farm in East Granby, then bring a truck to East Granby, grab the product, and bring it to market. That's not what's happening. They've decided to congregate their products to a, a place in Enfield and then move it to market. So I would agree that it's agricultural use for that farm if it's moving product for that farm. 
and for another farm in East Granby or Suffield or wherever they have property, they can bring a truck there and move that product to, to market. But to create a warehousing industry and a trucking industry and say, well, it's for the farm, well, it's for all the farms. And that's where you become into that area of a trucking company. It's no longer for the farm. I don't agree. I believe that a farm can be wherever that farm is and that the farmer has the right to have farms wherever in the vicinity of the tri-state area if he wants to have them, if he wants to rent space or own it. And if he does bring a truck to that facility, to that farm, to pick up product that he grew, then it's, it's okay. It's, it's exactly what we should be doing in this country. We should not be limiting people from working. And I don't believe that their use of their trucks on their farm, if it's in, in Enfield, East Windsor, Maine, doesn't matter. It's their farm using their vehicles to go where they need to go to bring it to market. And I also don't, I believe that the attorneys discussed it about the 150 mile rule. Now I'm not an expert. I can only go by the information in front of me. But I truly believe that we're hand we're trying to hand tie the farmer from trying to be a farmer. And it's not like the old days when you just farmed a plot of land and you sold your tomatoes at the end of the driveway. This is a farming operation, no different than what they do in the Midwest. But we're not hand tying the state did. I don't believe the, you the know state, that's the state said we I didn't interrupt you, miles. Mr. Chairman, so just give me a sec. But I don't believe what you're saying is accurate. And since we are not experts, we do not know if that's true. But they, that's what they told us. That's not what he said. It is. The state gives them 150 air miles. And then after that, they need to become a commercial truck. Okay. How far is an air mile versus a truck mile? Well, air miles as the crow flies. And what does that mean? That means from point A to point B in a straight line. And how many miles is that by truck? I don't know. Me neither. But I'm sure the state does. And we're not them, and that's not who's sitting here this, today. Okay. Anybody else? So I agree with Mary Ann that it doesn't have to be his land at um, that particular spot, but it's his farm, and, and the way today is, it's just different parcels all over the place. So as long as it's his product with his trucks, I think that's okay. I would just like us to be careful how we treat farmers. It's a difficult business and I think they treat it as a business. And if by chance there are things that we've all learned this evening of what the farm should move, then we should take that under advisement. I think from, uh, from my perspective, going on uh, Owen's word that they only transport their own goods to and from the farm, um, trusting that, that that is indeed fact. Um, again, I, I struggle with the 150 miles, right? And what Department of Transportation says is defined as focus on agricultural use and operations um, and agreeing with you Mr. Chairman that once you go past that circle of 150 miles are you still in that umbrella or have you created a shipping company and that that's where I'm I'm concerned with at this point um, I don't believe the land itself and and what they're doing there is requiring them to park the trucks there right so Again, that, that's my concern is are the trucks being parked there. Is it creating a terminal or is it simply really leveraging the land that they have so that they can get their product to market and, and, and leverage their trucks on the way back as well? Okay. Anything, Charlie? No, again, the only thing that bothers me is when he did say at some point they were for private hire. So as long as they're not for private hire, in the future, I have no problem. <laughs> now, 
we haven't done this in a while. Remind me, a yes vote goes because it's different for appeal of the zoning. Hang it. So let me read the motion and then we'll figure out if a yes means no. Okay. <laughs> appeal of the zoning enforcement officer cease and desist order following a notice of violation of section 6.2 industrial zones use table. 128 Moody Road, owner applicant, map 93, lot 5, zone I1 zone, according to the materials submitted by ZBA 2021-03030. Appeal of the, okay, so a yes, yes vote appeal. would be a, uphold the zoning enforcement officer? Right. So and a, yes a, is for the so a four, customer, and four, a yes is for the customer, no is for the zoning enforcement no. 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 That's not what they just said. A yes vote upholds the zoning enforcement officer. A no vote is for the applicant. Are we on? We're on the right page. Yes. Okay. So do your thing. All right. Roll call, please. Mola Rosa. Yes. So you're upholding the zoning enforcement yes. officer. Mary Ann Turner, against. Charlie Masterberti. Against. Kelly Davis. Against. Rich Stroney. Uh, yes. Upholding the. Four. Yes. Sorry. Um, two and voted for and three voted against. You need four for to hold it up and you need four to tone it down. So what do we do now? I'm, I'm reading the bylaws here. Um, so it says a majority of the members of the board present in voting shall constitute a quorum three out of five and the number of votes necessary to transact business shall be a majority of four or five of those members of the board present in voting except as noted in the statutes 8-7 which require a concurring vote of four members of the board to reverse any order, requirement, or decision of the official charged with the enforcement of the zoning regulations to decide in favor of an applicant any matter upon the board is required to pass under any bylaw ordinance, or three, to vary the application of the zoning regulations. Well, three have voted for the... So for the applicant and two have voted for the zoning enforcement officer. So I thought it was majority unless there was only four members voting. You want me to join in? And Ms. Missouri? If I may. We needed four affirmative if, votes yeah. to, to overturn the decision of Mr. Rochelle. We didn't get them, so you essentially upheld the decision of the zoning enforcement officer. So Correct. That's what happened. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that would be my loss. That's correct. You have to have four. If you don't have four to overturn my order, order then it stays. The, the enforcement order stays as is. Because I know usually right. it's a majority, and the only time you need a four hundred votes is if there were only four members. No, it's it's four. The, that's what it says in the regulations. Oh. You had to have all four. We have to say all four have to say yes. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I have no idea what to write there for reasons. Because I, I would have to write reasons both sides. I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to write. Okay. Um, I mean, we can just write that the order um, was upheld. Was upheld because the votes weren't there. So, 
Yeah, that's what I was just mentioning to Rick. <laughs> just make it a little more clear on, on how. We'll get together with you afterwards to uh, give our, our reasons why we voted no. And that way, those two reasons will be stated on the debate. Okay. The, it'll also be part of it. it well, it is part of the record. So, um, I mean, if you want to write it right now, you can, or we can review the record and write it in for you and have you look at it if you want. Um, but your reasons were stated on the I, record. I just so. believe that he's created a trucking company because of how he's doing the business offsite. Okay. So if Marianne wants to um, write that, then. Um, So could you clarify what the enforcement action will stop? The enforcement action will stop him from transport. He, he can transport up products. to the 150. No, he can transport products from that farm to wherever he wants. He yeah. can't bring product no, in. No, that's not at all. Okay, that, what is what does it the, do then? The issue is to stop him from having the trucks on the property. It's a transportation of other stuff of materials other than what is produced on farms. For instance, groceries that are not produced on the farm to grocery stores in New York, the transportation of Karis reels. Don't disagree with that. But are you saying he must remove the trucks? Yeah, it's not allowed under the zoning regulations. Right. But if he leaves the trucks there and he only moves his pumpkins and his his squash, he can leave the trucks there. See, I, where I'm having the issue is I agree with you that there's stuff written on Facebook. We all know people write stuff on Facebook. We don't know what was in the grocery bags. I agree that he talked about, I, I'm, not, I'm not here, I got, I got you, okay? I think we should just review the, the, what the record says and put that on the motion sheet. Um, I don't know that we should continue to discuss it now that it's closed. So, I, I think we have some issues with this. So, and, and I don't know how to write, we created, he created a trucking company and he's working outside his geography. That's, That's not right. We, all right, we will review the, the record. I would appreciate, through the chairman, if the, if the, the committee, the, the office wants to write something up, send it out to everybody so okay. that we can review, review it. And I don't think that quorum's a meeting. I'm not exactly sure the rules, so would you please make sure we don't go to Yes, so we, I'll, I'll check into that before I send it out, but and I will review the record. And if we have to, call us in. Okay. I really don't know what to write. All right. Thank you. Next application. ZBA 2021-0429, 20 Matthewson Avenue, variance application to section 410-3 to allow an increased lot coverage to 22%, where 20% is maximum, and to allow a 10 feet of rear yard where 35 feet is currently required. Martin Shana White, owner applicant, map 20, lot 303, residential 33 zone. Good evening, chairman, board members, planning staff. I am Shana White, 20 Matthewson Avenue. Hello, I'm Martin White, 20 Matthewson Avenue. Um, so we are here today uh, requesting a variance to increase our lot coverage from 20% to 22% and decrease our rear yard setback by 25 feet. Um, our lot is, is smaller than the neighboring properties, and uh, this is creating a hardship uh, for our family. It's preventing us from essentially gaining the permits necessary to redefine our outdoor living space. Uh, so um, 
one thing about this application that you may notice is we're uh, removing an existing ground level deck that is a non-conforming structure and we're going to replace it with a paver patio. Uh, doing this will decrease our lot's non-conformity uh, by 6%. So from 28% uh, all the way down to 22%. Um, and we're also requesting um, to add a 120 square foot concrete pad. Now this pad uh, is referenced in the uh, staffing report. Um, it is for a, it's not for a pool, but it's for a swim spa. So the swim spa is roughly 20,000 pounds. And so in the specification, they request at least four feet of reinforced concrete. Uh, so that's why we're requesting the rear yard setback is for the concrete structure, not for the patio. <laughs> Trying to think, is there anything else? Um, and I, I think that that explains what my hardship is. Uh, we included in our exhibit uh, some aerial photos of properties, um, you know, adjacent to ours, across the street. Um, all have structures on their lots, um, and so you know, we're hoping just to get into you know have the same um, privileges that our neighbors have by getting this variance. Else? Um, I went out to the property and it's a very short lot. Um, there, it's, we've seen this before in some of the neighborhoods and it's not deep enough and there's not much, you could, there's a fence, I don't know if all of you went out. Anyway, um, and you can see it. But I do have a question more to the staff. What is the difference between a concrete pad and a patio being made of brick? <laughs> um, it's the the pavers that the patio are made out of just make it um, less pervious. Whereas the the concrete the the issue that we had with the concrete wasn't necessarily the setback, but the impervious coverage on the site, which is why we suggested. Um, in the staff report, uh, based on our calculations, that maybe the approval will be for 23% instead of 22%. Um, but I don't know what, that's not the question. Why is the concrete a, a, not any different, dip, considered different than the patio structure? Because we don't worry about the patio being part of the lot coverage. The issue comes into play when it's a raised concrete structure. Um, supporting it it's but it's, it's under, not i'm sorry go ahead so so similar to a deck that's right similar to a deck that's raised the problem when when this first came in it came in as a building permit uh back in october i believe and uh the issue was that they were over and still over their lot coverage um, the deck that's presently on the house now is not the deck that shows up in the assessor's card. And so it was difficult getting a, uh, an actual lot coverage. I actually went out there and took some pictures and, and we measured it. And if they reduce or take, even if they get rid of it, they're still over by a small percentage over the lot coverage. Okay. No, but hang on, I, I, it's like two different stories here. If they're, they're taking the deck out completely, the only thing then on their property is their house. Correct, but when they put... No, hang on, yep. which means they're 20% because their house sits they're, on it? They're, they're a little over their 20%. Because, and, the, okay, Okay, because permits were not taken out when certain things were done. But, but... For, but that, but there's nothing more than the house if you take out the deck, right? Correct, and they're still over. Okay, what was added? I mean, they've only owned it a short time. No, they, they, I understand that. We had that conversation. It's not really their responsibility, but their predecessors, because right. there was an open porch that was enclosed and made into part of the rear garage, and there wasn't a permit for the garage itself. So. The, okay, the, so so when I 
because so, when I looked, I'm looking at the house structure. So the house structure started at one end, went to the other end. It's kind of rectangular box, plop there, and they have this deck on the back. So you're basically telling me that the garage and the screened in piece or whatever in that re rectangle is what's causing. So the house itself is over 20%. Correct. Got it. By a small percentage, but they are over. So anything okay. more that you're going to add Just keeps there. making it more over. Yes. Okay. And that then comes to the point that the property is just causing them their problem. It is, but so in our as staff, we can't approve something that makes it more worse, worse right. and non-conforming. So that's Could you why answer we, my question regarding concrete because I don't believe it's it's not going to be a foot. It's going to be inches. I'm not worse. really sure. To be perfectly honest with you, the. It's a large amount of concrete, right? It's yes, it, roughly 120 square feet. But we don't know the depth there. Oh, 66 cubic feet, so about a little under three yards of concrete will be needed. What's, what's the depth? Uh, How four, inches. four inches. Four inches. Okay. With three and okay. four. Yeah, about the size of a paver. Two pavers. Think about it. Okay. So that was my question. If, you're, if pavers are allowed and they're not considered part of the overage, why can't this concrete pad be considered the same? I know they're already over. Forget that part. Okay. So at, at one point when this was discussed, there was a question of whether or not it was going into the ground. Okay. Being in, placed into the ground. So if it's placed into the ground, under our normal regulations, above ground pools, and I understand it's a spa, but above ground pools are not counted as lot coverage. However, in ground pools are counted as lot coverage. But this isn't in ground. It's gonna sit on this pad. Hang on, why is this thing sitting on a pad? So uh, it is filled uh, 19,000 pounds. And so the manufacturer's warranty says, in, in here and also, I'm on the top of Matthewson, which is down the bottom of my street, is the uh, Connecticut River. So I have a high water table already in my yard seeps. So um, there is an option to use gravel and um, blocks. However, knowing the history in the area, concrete with reinforced rebar is a preferred uh, choice. The manufacturer's saying that because of stability. Yes, is. it has to be yep. level surface. So now you have a solid foundation Absolutely. For so your property has a water issue. Oh, indeed, okay. indeed. Um, also, Marion, I just wanted to point out there has been some gray area in the regulations where things don't agree, which we know our regulations have quite a few of those, and that's why we're working to fix a lot of them. Um, when it comes to coverage, uh, there is a coverage definition. Um, let me pull it up really quickly. And it says uh, the percentage which the aggregate building area of all buildings on a lot bears to the total area of that lot. The area of an above ground swimming pool shall not be counted in determining building coverage for a lot. Now if you go down to uh, section 4.10, which is the residential regulations where the table for lot and area bulk requirements are, and it says, in addition, no building, accessory building, or structure inclusive of decks, inclusive of decks, porches, steps, loading docks, um, and then it repeats docks, <laughs> porches, or steps again, attached or otherwise associated with such building or buildings. 4.10 um, point what? It's, it's just 4.10. Is it the table? It's the paragraph above the table, um, which, it, I mean, it, it basically says all the things that have to come into compliance with the table. So that's sort of where we draw from um, what the challenge here, though, it's not a, pool, it's a concrete pad, right? Which makes it non-porous. Well, it's a, it's a concrete pad with a pool to on. be able to put a pool down because they have right. a water problem. Absolutely, right. So it's oh, not it's not a traditional pool, which wouldn't then be counted. So we can ignore the whole um, spa pool 
because it's really about the concrete pad right. taking up. Right. So space. I just wanted to clarify that one question about right. what what is counted but and covered still, or not. I'm still not seeing it. If they can put in a patio with con with block, why is this concrete pad considered different? Well, I think the the blocks allow water to go through. Concrete is solid. That's that's why an in ground pool is considered as lock coverage when above ground isn't because above ground is temporary and water can seep in supposedly around it where an in ground creates an impervious area. It's taking up space on that lot. That's how it's been. So their driveway. No, we don't consider driveways. So that I'm with you. I could have a concrete driveway, but you don't count that as coverage. Not a driveway. I'm sorry. You're just, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, okay. I'm I didn't write them. I'm just yes, dealing so with them. Okay. And this is why we are rewriting them. Any other questions? The, um, just the change in the setback. Where does that come into play? So it comes into play because of the concrete. So I was considering that as an accessory structure. And so placement on the yard in relation to the property boundary, that's why I was thinking I'll need a decrease in the setback of the concrete pad. Well, actually, that's not in here. No. You're only here for lot coverage, correct? It's advertised as also, they, that's what yeah. they applied for. It was also the setback. Um, but that's not what you're telling us we have to vote on. We're voting on lot coverage. But it was in the advertisement. Right, and it's included in the motion. And it's in one of the questions on, on one of the forms here that they highlight. Okay, but that, but I'm asking you, where the heck did I put it? Yeah, they didn't put it on, the, on our... When I say they, are we meaning that they or this they? Because if we're saying this they, they're not the professionals. So is this they saying that we're here to talk about a 10 foot, the, to allow a 10 feet of rear yard where 35 is required? Right. Right. No, I'm reading the advertisement. I want to know who they said that was what we needed to be talking about today. Because my motion is only about lot coverage. That was the, allow the 10 feet. That was the, the draft motion that I put in the staff report because I had been looking at it as um, when we when we had talked about the port the deck needing uh, being replaced and needing a setback variance um, that's what when I advised you that's what I thought that um, you were going with but the patio um, I thought uh, could be ad adhering to the accessory building standards which require or allow for um, it existing within five feet of the side and rear property lines um, as in regards to the concrete pad, I, I mean, the commission, we, we are looking at it for coverage. The commission can look at it and, and in regards to that setback too and, and grant the variance for the uh, setback to section 4.10 um, just to clarify things and it would only be for the concrete pad as usual. And it is also in, in the applicant's statement. Right, but I think that's because, again, she's not the professional. I think but, she thinks that's what she thinks she needs. I don't think she needs it. And we should probably have not put it in there. So are, are you counting the concrete slab as an accessory structure? And then it would only need five feet to the property line. Right. That is how I interpreted it. We don't need Right. Right. Oh. I read it as. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're good. Yes. So all we're talking about, sure. I just want to, because I don't believe this motion that I'm going to read is accurate. And I don't want to put, unless I have to read it that way because you put the legal mm -hmm. notice in and then mm -hmm. we're. Sorry. I don't want to, I don't mean to interrupt you. Um, no, no. I just want to make sure that if I read it, I have to vote on it. If I no. don't say it, I don't. So it was difficult only because they, they asked for everything, which I would recommend everybody who comes into the app office to ask for everything that they want to get it all on the meeting. Um, when I wrote the staff report, I felt that maybe the 35 foot um, to 10 foot variance 
uh, might not be required. That's why I wrote it into the staff report that way. But I didn't want to preclude them from getting a variance if, in fact, the board disagreed with me and felt that they would need to grant a variance for that. Um, since, since it's so, in here, we should probably make a motion to take that out as part of our approval and then approve it without it. Does that make sense? That way we're so, clean with what you've published. Right. So, and we yeah. can give them what I, they need. And that was without. really where you got me. I want to make sure that we only read and vote on what's needed mm -hmm. and not make an error. Right. Okay. So my, my, my recommended motion only, I believe, had the lot coverage in it. No. Um, but then the motion sheet that you got, see, I didn't want to. I understand your reasons, so we need to understand now what our next step is. Okay. So, do we... Do you have anything else to add? Uh, thank you for your consideration. Any other questions? Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Um, I'm sorry, did, did you... I know there's no one here, but did you open it to the public? No, I, <laughs> what did you assume? I would just yeah. say it in the record <laughs> so that it's clean. So I don't yeah, think we'll have any issues, but... Needs. There's nobody here. But well, you still got to close All it. Right. Jesus. Well, that's what we're doing. Okay. Is there anybody in the audience wishing to speak in favor or against? Anybody wishing to speak in favor or against? Last time, anybody in the audience was in favor or against? Seeing there's nobody in the audience, do I have a motion to approve? Made by Marianne. Second. Seconded by Kelly. Discussion. I think they should have their pool, and I think they should have their concrete pad, and I think that their property causes their problems in multiple ways. It's too short, it's wet, and... Uh, and, and I think they're reducing the... And, and they've, they're working very hard to come into compliance. Yes. The question now is, do we make a, a vote to remove the 10 feet of rear yard where 35 is required? I'm going to make a required? motion to take off the part, if I may, about the 10 feet rear setback adjustment to what was read originally. By Rich, do I have a second? I second. Second by Charlie. Discussion? Roll call? And this is just on the change. This is just on the change. Mola Rosa? Yes. Mary Ann Turner? Yes. Charlie Masterberti? Yes. Uh, Kelly Davis? Yes. And Rich Stroney? Yes. Any other discussion on the main motion? I make a motion that we vote on the revised motion, or well, the motion as revised. Second. And if, if, if I could just get uh, Madam Secretary to read it as revised. So, so we have second it. Okay. Second. Second. Thank you. Okay. So the motion would read, a variance application, no, 20 Matheson Avenue. Let me try again. Motion to approve ZBA 2021-04-29, 20 Matheson Avenue, variance application to section 4103 to allow an increase in lot coverage to 22% where 20 is the maximum. And then. Uh, I, I would like to. We're just working on the motion, so. I, I would like to adjust the, the motion. I would like it to read for concrete slab only. Um, we understand. So, for a concrete slab only, was there a size to this? If I um, if I can jump in really quickly, in my staff report, I did the calculations for this, and it comes out to 22.67%. So I had recommended that maybe it be amended to do 23, just so that we're clean and there are no issues down the line. Okay. Okay, so what if I add for a concrete slab under the pool? What's that thing called? Swim spa. Swim spa under the swim spa only. Estimated at 120 square feet. Approximately 120 square feet. I like that. Want me to read it again? Sure. Okie dokie. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to actually vote, or are we just still practicing? Well, as long as we have a motion and a second on, on what you read, we're good. 
Okay, I make a motion to approve ZBA 2021-0429, 20 Matheson Avenue, variance application to Section 4103 to allow an increase in lot coverage to 23%, where 20% is the maximum for a concrete slab under the swim spa only, which is approximately 120 square feet. Second. Second by Kelly. MA. Any discussion? Kelly. Roll call. Mo La Rosa? Yes. Mary Ann Turner, four. Charlie Masterberti? Yes. Kelly Davis? Yes. Rich Stroney? Yes. We got it. Five zero zero. <laughs> Thank you. Office in the next couple of days and they'll help you through the next few steps. Thank you. It is. It is. You can actually grow in it also and it has some jets. <laughs> Thank you for the consideration. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. It's nice meeting you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, the reason for approval. The removal of the uh, deck made it uh, more conforming okay the property has a water table issue and yeah but you had an ending um, water table issue and and the slab is required by the slab is required okay Everybody has the minutes for April. Make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Something none. Roll call, please. Mo La Rosa. Yes. Mary Ann Turner. Yes. Charlie Masterberti. Yes. Uh, Kelly Davis. Yes. Rich Stroney. Yes. Correspondent staff report. You're up. Um, I don't have much to uh, report on. Um, we actually don't have any other applications for ZBA in the office. Um, welcome back. <laughs> yes, welcome back to the chambers. It's new and fancier. I don't know how to work all of the technology in here yet, but Alex will help me along the way, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, and is the PAR report out yet? It's coming back. Oh, we are. I did. I have been sending them in, so <laughs> it is back. Let's get a copy so that we can read it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there's any past ones, I'll talk for all of you. Send it to us. I can. It, it doesn't um, come out of our office, but I can talk to maybe town manager's office about getting yeah, getting it. We, uh, do, do they get posted on the town site at all, or no? I'm really not sure. <laughs> They're an internal document. Okay. okay. But since we're on planning, zoning, yep. ZBA, economic development, the PAR report, which I forgot what the initials stand for, it's very interesting. So I would ask that we all get it. And if there's yep. any past ones, um, send us those too. Not that you all want to print them like me, but. All right. Um the application review of application forms I'm driving myself crazy so this originated because we wanted to re uh, Kind of just redo the um, auto location approval form to mirror the what the K7 form asks from the DMV, and that really will take uh, a lot of pressure off of Marianne to try to decipher what she should be signing off on when these K7 K7 forms come into the office. Um, and so we brought that K7 or the uh, auto location approval application form sort of into. Um, today's standards for what our forms look like with today's letterhead um, as well 
and while we were at it, we just moved the variance information and the appeals applications forms um, over to that formatting as well. So all the same information should be there. We did take out a few redundant questions, um, but other than that, we tried to keep it all on one document, one page. It might be one page front and back, but that was the goal was to keep it on one, one document page. Um, I'd like to talk about the Department of Motor Vehicles form. It's on the last page, guys. Or it feels like the last page. It's not. Three in. Three in on the back. Okay? And one of the things I come to realize, and the poor office staff had to listen to me and go read your minutes, because I wasn't at the last meeting where you had a K-7 application. And we need to be extremely careful. And Jen, you need to jump in because the, it actually would have been great to bring up the information from the last meeting because we started to cut, I, I'm standing there, I have to sign this. You folks started to use language intermittently in different ways, but I don't have the materials in front of me. Remember Jen? That, or, or Rick, when we were talking about it, they used general repairer, and then they'd use a different one, and then the lawyer used a different one, and then you guys went and made a motion with the wrong words, and then what happened, I'm standing there, and I gotta sign this thing, but what you actually voted on is what not really what you meant, but I'm not there to interpret what you meant. I can only go by what you said and what you wrote. And that night, I wasn't there, so, the office staff and I had quite a roundabout on the last one because it came down to, to um, can we talk about it because it's closed? Does, does it not matter? Um, I wouldn't get too much into the details about what the application so, itself. So all it really was was, the, is... was the addressing. Can I, I don't know where we, it was well, an address. It was 710 and 718 Enfield Street, and there's two different, um, you may, if you recall, the board made two different motions for the properties that night. Um, and just the motions, the way that the wording came across, it didn't line up with the boxes that you check on the top of the K-7 forms. So it was a little bit of interpretation as to what, uh, there's boxes, a difference between you know, limited repairs. Dealer, used dealer, general repair, okay. Right, right. Those, those boxes didn't necessarily line up, line up with the language used. And, then, and so. if I remember right, because you put the, the addresses when you made a certain motion to a certain K-7, you broadened it to both sides, which I don't think you meant. You meant one side to be one thing and yeah, one, one side, side to be- One supposed to have the general repair and the other side supposed to have used car. The motions yeah. were 710 had the general repair and used car, but 718 only had the used car and no repair could take place. Yeah. But when, if you go back and look, and you look at, you, ha you literally said 710 and 718 got the used car license. Because I thought we modified it. I thought, I thought we did. I thought we modified it so that it was we were only doing one at a time and each right. one was done separately. One one lot had one and one lot had the other. It, the the way the motions were was seven ten and seven eighteen were both approved for the used cars and then the seven eighteen was only for the general or you gave the used cars. Or seven ten was only also allowed for General repairs. But the the way that it came down, and and I can't when I'm standing there, and this is in front of me, and I have to sign my life away. Let me tell you something. I'm not there to act like I know what they mean, Jen, and that's not what they mean. Because Jen's like, the motion says this, right, Rick? We 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 went round and round on it. So my request is, we have to be careful on language when we're talking about the K-7s and use these boxes up here, new dealer, used dealer, general repair, limited repair, leasing, manufacturing, that we actually use those words. That's what I'm asking. 
So we just need to all keep it on our list of things to do. Now you had a, was there something you had to add? Or? Well, yeah, there's, and I'm not sure where it would be put on here. But from what I understand, we can do things on here that would be very specific, um, which, uh, and, and I won't get specific on property, but we have a property that we uh, uh, gave it one thing, but then it became another thing. And if we were very specific on the K-7 that we had authorized for this use only, then that issue would have gone away. But we didn't. So we just checked boxes. And that was actually one of the first ones we ever did that just kind of got us rolling on this K7 issue. And so listen, so I guess my question through you to them, taking what you just said, we need to go find out, can we write on this? Yeah, we just can we send it to the, you know, the Department of Motor Vehicle and say, you know, Mary Ann Turner's garage is only going to be able to do X and it may fall under general repair, but we don't need anything more than something. I know well, we're going to do it. Well, I know that our town attorney's office has said that we can't there, that the board cannot condition the approvals for this. So I would imagine. I don't know that if that would be considered a condition, though. We can certainly look into the, if the DMV is it. I guess accustomed to taking like added specific right, language. Do they, do they have a definition for each, like the difference between a general repair and a limited repair, what a limited repair really constitute, because that might help address what, what Mary Ann's saying, mm -hmm. which is if we're only allowing simple things like oil changes and brakes, that might be the limited repair versus the full drop an engine, replace transmissions, things like that. Yeah, they, they do have those definitions and we can certainly get them to you. Okay, so. That would be an important thing for us. So I do. think from mm -hmm. the request it to you to them is those definitions need to be on every K7 from this point forward, not the form, but the documents we receive since we now no longer have any rules for K7s. Okay. Is that reasonable? Yep. Is that what you were trying to accomplish, just to better define what we're, what we're oh, approving? And we stay to the right language when we make our, because remember, we no longer have the five reasons. We have nothing. Yep. It might be good for the applicant also to kind of circle what they plan to do so that the office is confirming that they're filling it out for the right reason. And that way it's clear for us as well that we see what they're, what they're looking to do. Because really what could happen? They come in here to do one thing. We give them a certain box. It then opens up their latitude. And then we're like, what are you doing? It says attach additional, additional pages if necessary. I don't know if they meant me. That All could. we have to do is once and we'll find out, right? <laughs> <laughs> they will let us know, won't they? All right, other business? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. So just for reference, if you're good with the rest of the forms, I'll revise the auto location form and...